So before we started recording, you asked me, where do they go? And actually, where does anybody go? Nobody goes anywhere except they're no longer in the physical body. So they're around and when we're in the physical body, the part of our inner being and our consciousness that has access to higher inner levels unless we get spiritual training or we have natural abilities in that direction, and this includes a, a human or an animal, <laughs> then we, we aren't really aware of those other levels. So since we leave the physical body, we're in the same environment that we were in before. And sometimes because I had, I had lots and lots of cats, I've had dogs around me, and I, I used to breed pet rats, I had lots of rats. And because I have intermittent clairvoyant abilities, I would take some rats to get, get put down and I'd come home and they'd be going, wow, I can climb the walls. I could see the rat running up the wall. <laughs> and, and they learn they can pass through things and they learn that you're not paying attention to them quite the same way that you were, but they can really feel your love. Mm -hmm. And so they're around on the physical level. And then they also, and again, this includes animals and humans. They also go to kind of, non-physical levels where you're not aware of of the material plane so in many ways um, being on the other side it's 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 like you can flit in and out of a dream state and it tends to happen kind of spontaneously so at times the person or the animal is in the physical plane looking out around looking at what's going on around them the animal can feel a lot more of your feelings and emotions and thoughts than they could when they were physical humans too can really tell what we're thinking and feeling, which might sound a little creepy, but <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Everything becomes kind of an open book. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but then they'll go into these other states of consciousness. And for an animal, and for many humans who don't necessarily have any kind of spiritual training, they don't really realize that they're going into a completely non-physical perception of awareness or, or what you could call a dream state. So when, when an animal has a very strong bond to us, they will keep on checking in. Mm. And they'll, they'll go more and more into these other levels and other planes. And there's a, there's a natural life cycle on the other side that all beings go through. And it, it, there's, we have all these different bodies. That's one way to describe it. So we have the physical body, we have an emotional body, we have a mental body, we have a spiritual body. We have an etheric body, which is sort of our, our physical energy. It's connected to our physical energy, but it's not really physical itself. And all these different bodies after death, they break down at different speeds and different rates. They need to kind of finish themselves off, so to speak. So sometimes if I remember, again, with, with the kind of clairvoyance I sometimes have, sitting parked in a car at night, on the side of the road and I was talking to somebody and then I could see in front of me this kind of transparent dog mm -hmm. and the dog could, took a few steps and then startled and then went right back to where it was, took a few steps, startled. It was obvious this, that this was a dog that had hit by a car mm -hmm. and it wasn't the dog itself. Some people would think, well, that's the ghost and that's the ghost replaying its experience, but it's actually the etheric body replaying the experience because the trauma froze the etheric body in place mm. and so the etheric body is there replaying 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 and it's slowly because it's it's a sort of a some semi-electric semi-plastic it's probably the best way to describe it form of energy that's a bridge between the physical and the spiritual that's its purpose it, it slowly it slowly fades out over time. So it's this repeated image that will eventually sort of fade out. But the actual animal itself is long past that experience, which was this Yeah, sudden, that animal's oh, not stuck to that, right? Oh, definitely not. Definitely not. So that's what the etheric body does. The emotional body is in all of us animals, humans, it, it's it 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 tends to still feel the feelings that it's feeling, want to live out the things it never got to live out in life. For humans, things are a lot more complicated because you really, you, you see all the people you left behind and you, sh you go through a lot of the, your, your feelings about those relationships that are more complex. With the animals, they're going to be around the people that they loved mm -hmm. and just, just really loving them. <laughs> and, you know, it's when I do clear, when psychic work with people 
and they ask to speak to pe people on the other side. Sometimes the people are, are, are available, sometimes they're not, but animals are always there. Animals will always just come bouncing through. Like, I love you, I love you, I love you. That's their whole message. And a lot of times humans, that's their message too, because that's really the only thing when it comes down to it, that's the only thing that really matters at all is love. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason we do anything. That's why we're here. All the other processes of evolution are to perfect our, our expression of love, our understanding and capacity for love. And the rest is window dressing when, when you really look at the ultimate reality. And this is what a lot of people will, if they didn't realize it when they were alive, they will realize it after they die. Animals know anyway. Yeah, because they're unconditional, right? Like yeah. 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 To, like, it's just pure love. Yeah. 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 It's just pure love. And that's why we love them so much. <laughs> it is just pure love <laughs> now there's a there's a there's an evolutionary um structure to existence i suppose you could put it and the general rule and and you know there's life is very organic and there's general rules and there's always exceptions to those rules but the general rule is that all souls come up through the animal kingdom and then enter the human kingdom eventually mm -hmm. and what's very interesting is that the very last experiences in the animal kingdom are as animals that have close contact with humans and the ideal is to be somebody's pet sometimes they're they're the more unpleasant experiences of close contact with humans mm -hmm. and one of the reasons for that's well there's so many different reasons but the human brain is if you study the evolution of the brain and how it how it develops as animals progress through evolution there's a whole hierarchy in each stage of evolution. There's a, there are new capacities added to the structure of the brain. So the reptiles have the reptile brain, and so do, so do mammals, and so do humans, so do birds. And it is focused on survival and breeding. And it's very, it's, it's very black and white in its reactiveness. It's very intense in its reactivity. Then when you move into the mammal kingdom, and I, I wish I knew a little more about the bird kingdom because it's, more, it's a more complex evolution. The, the yogic teaching is that the bird kingdom actually evolves towards the angelic realm. What is, does that mean like towards well, like... That means, um, that means that souls come in through the reptile realm, then they're gonna branch out. They're gonna go to the bird kingdom or to the mammal kingdom. If yeah. they go into the bird kingdom, then they're gonna go to the angelic realm. Now the angelic realm, is a completely inner realm. There's not there's not physical bodies, but it 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 maintains on a frequency level or a force and power level certain specific laws of nature or divine laws. That's what that's what the angelic kingdom is about. So it is kind of black and white, and like you know, like the reptile is about my survival, and then the birds are about my survival and my offspring's survival and beginning to see a bigger picture of everything. And then move into the angelic kingdom is going to be about the, the maintenance of existence, which is our survival, the collectivist survival of existence. But anyway, I went off on a bit of a tangent, but with, with, but you're with mammals, that, you're hmm? saying that we would have started off as like dogs and cats. Is that kind of what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Most people have. Yeah. Yeah. But what's up? So, We'll continue, I'll get back to that because it's significant in terms of our experience with our pets and what, what it does for them. But when you go into the mammal kingdom, you start to, this, the, the midbrain develops and the midbrain develops emotion. And it also develops you know, logic and reasoning to a certain level. The front brain, which is what humans have, is capable of all kinds of really complex reasoning. But in the mammal kingdom, we're really developing the emotional side of existence but what mammals don't have that humans do have is a sense of the future so mammals will have the memory of the past and the experience of the present which is why it's just so horrendous to be cruel to animals or to do medical experimenting on animals because they don't have the ability to detach that humans have mm -hmm. they're just completely caught in the experience um, but they're also very pure in their experience, in their experience of love, and when they're get when they're in their reptile brain, you know, forget about how I love mommy, feed me now. <laughs> you know, that's that's the cat speaking. <laughs> the dog can wait longer. The dog, 
<laughs> the dog's developing a different part of that emotional brain. But to in it's it's another general rule in nature that in order to move to a next level of development, we naturally are attracted to or draw to ourselves mentors and those who 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 show us just by example or possibly by teaching what our next step is. I mean, even even as an animal is developing, say a, say a cat that's developing more naturally, so to speak, where the mother cat will teach the kittens how to hunt. I, I, I was talking to a friend last week and she, 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 um, cat pet sits and there was this, there's this one cat that's very, very Zen and gets along with all the other animals. And so the cat was being friendly with the squirrels and the mother squirrel actually brought the babies out and was kind of teaching the babies how to evade a predator, utilizing this cat as an opportunity to teach the babies how to evade a predator. So the parents, just like in the human kingdom, the parents will teach their children what they need in order to survive. So once a soul is reaching the point where it's ready to graduate from the mammal kingdom, the parents become the humans. So we are preparing them for becoming human. And I always would say to my, my animals, take your time, don't be in a rush. <laughs> it's really hard to be human. So just, just take as much time as you need before you take that leap. <laughs> partly, partly humorously, but it, it's kind of true. Yeah. Um, so what happens too then is you really do build a deep bond. And we just be, just in the same way that we have soulmates in love relationships who are souls that we've been mated to and partners with, in many lifetimes. And the reason we, re we return to those relationships is because we're natural equals. We mm -hmm. have some parallel evolutionary directions. There are also parent-child soul bonds where there's a kind of deeper soul relationship that, that people will return to again and again to be parents and children with one another. Uh, and many times that kind of parent-child soulmate relationship, it will switch. So in one lifetime, Person A might be the father and person B might be the son. And the next lifetime, person B is the mother and person A is the son. And, you know, it changes. Mm -hmm. you're, you're never always that person's parent. A lot of times you're that person's child. It switches around. And we can have, we can have a soul bond with animals. Mm -hmm. So that that particular soul, we're going to love that soul profoundly and deeply and they love us profoundly and deeply and they return to us again and again. I actually worked with a client who had a traumatic past life memory going back a few lifetimes of losing her horse. There was such an incredible bond with that soul that, and it was, you know, a, a really ugly death that she didn't have any control over in that lifetime, but it still impacted her. So to heal that, but to know that we never, we can never, ever, ever lose anybody or anything that we love because emotion is the force. If you look at the word, it's E dash motion. It, emotion always draws us towards things. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the, the law of reincarnation, the law of when we make connections with, with of people or animals it's love that will draw us back together it's also anger and hatred will draw us back together so this is why if we have an enemy it's really important to either forgive and love and dismantle that feeling of enmity or to create a feeling of neutrality mm -hmm. you're not going to draw that same situation to yourself again so <clears throat> the love will bring the animals back to us and it's painful when they go, but it's, it's only temporary. And it's, uh, it's very natural and important to be kind to yourself while you're going through that grieving period. But at the same time, to be blessing that animal and saying, you know, I, I'm sure you're having a wonderful time. And if you want to come back, you're welcome to come back. I actually had one, one kid. He was, I, know he's, I forget how old he was, about nine or ten that I gave a rat to and the moment that he'd never even seen rats before, but the moment that he sort of visited that litter, this one little rat climbed up on his shoulder and that was it. They were bonded for life. <laughs> and he took such good care of that animal. But I knew that that soul was going to be his child in this lifetime. 
like what do you mean like well like he's eight or nine years old and this is this so this 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 little critter was oh, later his on. final yeah. final animal lifetime so by the time this this kid is you know 20 30 years later because we have certain evolutionary things we need to do in between having a, our last animal lifetime and our first human lifetime the timing is 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 correct the timing is perfect for this soul to come back as this 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 man at that point in time this man's son or daughter that's cool yeah yeah now that's very unusual because usually it take we, we spend quite a few lifetimes in each stage of development so you know a, a, a soul will be a pet for quite a while before it finally makes that flying leap but that sometimes keep coming back to that person like yes yeah and then they may have bonds with more than one person that they might come back to but a lot of times there's the one there's one soul that, that, that they do keep coming back to definitely mm. and then eventually when they're when they're human you probably know them know each other again as well so that's nice yeah so we should not ever belittle the love that we have for an animal and think it's not as important as a love for a human and think that grieving for an animal it very strongly means there's something wrong with us because it's, it's only an animal <laughs> it's not like yeah, that well uh yeah like obviously we're talking about this because i lost my cat on friday yeah. but um i think a lot of people you know that they're, they're not not everyone understands the same relationship if they haven't had pets. Yes. Um, that the grief can, it's simulating the same kind of grief. Like I lost my dad when I was 19. It feels the same. Like, and I, I, I know that sounds crazy to some people, but um, the anxiety and the angst and the, you feel gutted for like, this is someone you, you know, this was 14 oh. years, right? That's a long time, but it's unfortunate they can't spend, well, I know what you're going to say after I say this. It's I was saying to my friend, it's unfortunate she couldn't have lived as long as I did. But I guess you're, what you're saying is they come back in other ways, potentially. They do. They do. And, you know, they teach us about loss. I mean, one of the reasons I was glad to have, have rats as pets and have them around my kids is that they have really short lifespans. That's the only complaint I ever got from anybody I gave a rat to yeah. was rat died <laughs> you know but it's good for at? kids to learn they how to do that. don't they how old do they die at their, their their average lifespan is two and a quarter years it's a very short lifespan yeah. it's long enough to get really attached if you really love that soul but on the other hand because they have such short lifespans they come back quickly so i've seen the same souls come back and they are so phenomenally unique it's impossible to tell yourself, oh, it's just a different one. It's, it's just not the different one. It's, it's definitely the same one. <laughs> you know, I, I watched Run Rat struggle with the same karmic issue for three lifetimes. Mm. So no one should feel guilty by getting a new pet because it could be the, the same soul. Yes. Now, I'll tell you one story about, because uh, I want to move into some stories about actual reincarnations. And this wasn't my own pet. This is actually from Ann Davies, who was, um, she was, at one point in time, the leader of Builders of the Atatum, which is a spiritual organization that I've been involved with. And she had a dog that she just adored this little dog. And she would spend hours petting this little dog and saying, you're just such a perfect dog. You're so perfect. And then she said it, but you'd be even more perfect if you were a female. And she'd pet him some more. And you'd be even more perfect if you had a little white mark here on your head. And, and she wasn't really thinking about it, but she was just in this dreamy state while she was saying this to this little dog. And then when the dog passed away and, and she, she knew that there'd probably be a point where the dog would come back. And then she and Paul Case, who was the founder of Builders of the Atatum, at a certain point in time, I don't know how long it was, probably a couple of years after the dog had passed away, they both had the sense, the dog's back. And, and let's look around, where's the dog? <laughs> so they were, they were going and checking out different breeders and they finally went, let's go to this breeder. So they went to the breeder and a little puppy crawled up to her and it, and it was just an instantaneous love, instantaneous connection, knew it was the same soul. It was a female and it had the marking exactly where she had always kept imagining the little male dog whose mark would be. That's cool. 
yeah, so she talks, tells that story to talk about how the things that we impress upon the subconscious by what we repeat and what we meditate on and envision will manifest. But it's also this kind of an ongoing communication and relationship that's partially subconscious between that, those two souls. And of course, the dog wants to please mom. <laughs> oh, I'm so perfect. And you think I'd be even more perfect if I was like this. Okay, I'd like to do that. That's fine. So boom. <laughs> and, that, and that little soul comes. But otherwise, the exact same personality. That's cool. Yeah. And does, it, do, does the animal soul, rem, so they do remember or not? Is it kind of like us coming into different lifetimes? They don't necessarily remember that. They usually they don't remember. They usually don't remember. But again, I mean, there are unusual individuals in the human world there are, that do. There are unusual individuals. Yeah, that. That do. But what does, but what, 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 what does remember is the subconscious, which is tied to our emotional state. And because animals are so emotional and so pure in their reactions, they know right away that they love you. They don't even question it. It's like, oh, I just love this person. And they just come. That's why, the, that's why they often say you should let an animal pick you. Yeah. Because they know. <laughs> they know who they're supposed to be with. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, I had lost, uh, I had a cat um, just after my dad died. And he died quite young at 10 years old. This was quite a few years ago. It's my only other animal I actually had lost. And I had, I had vowed after, because I had just Emily at the time, that I would never get another pet and that the only way I would get another pet is if I had a sign. And literally, like I said that, like that night and the next morning, I had an email um, to, my, to my inbox at work and it was um, a, a picture of Gordon, um, who I have now. And he, um, they were probably going to put him down because he had a broken tail and he'd been abused. Wow. And I just, I, like, I didn't even question it. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to save him. So it's just interesting how, you know, I had kind of vowed I'd never go through that pain again. And then <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Like, now I'm going through it again and I'm down to one cat again. And I'm just, you know, but it is true. Like when the timing, like if, if it's meant to be, it will be, you yeah. know, yeah. 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 Really do pick you for mm -hmm. sure. Mm hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so my own personal animal reincarnation stories started when, you know, when I was a when I was a child and into my teens. And we had a we had a dog named Lady, and she was a black Alsatian from South Africa. And Alsatian is the European version of the German Shepherd. They're almost identical. They're just a little more finely boned. Mm -hmm. So she was, you know, she was carefully imported from the breeder we used to get the dogs from when we lived in South Africa. And my father, because she was such a purebred, he wanted to breed her, had her papers and everything. So whenever he would take her to a breeder, she would sit down when she was in heat. No way, she's not going to breed. <laughs> you could never get this dog bred. And she was very, very well obedience trained. She could be let out the front door. She was trained to know her property line, and she would never leave the property. Mm -hmm. She'd always, always so obedient. She was a, she was a, Dogs generally like to please you, and this dog would turn herself inside out to please you. She was just that way. Mm -hmm. The thing about it was that she had a boyfriend, and the boyfriend was this little tiny mongrel, <laughs> black and white spots and fur everywhere, <laughs> and they just adored each other. He was constantly visiting, and, and they were just so happy whenever he was around. And that's, I think, why she would never breed when we took her to the breeders, because like she's already got a mate. I'm not, I'm not going to bother with this guy. <laughs> so... So, you know, years went by, the, the boyfriend would visit regularly. And one day, the boyfriend was on the neighbor's driveway. So lady, all excited, she runs over onto the neighbor's driveway, sniffing noses with her boyfriend. And my father came to the door and he said, lady, you goddamn blah, blah, dog, get in here. And she just, her, her tail fell, her head fell. She slinked into the house and she was just so crushed. Now, remember, she'd been completely obedient, never, ever left the property. But this was, you know, love just overrode everything. And after, she didn't live very long after that. She got cancer and died. She just died of a broken heart. Mm. So a few years go by. And my, my, at that point, I wasn't living at home anymore. And my mother phoned me and she said, there's a woman across the street. She just lost her husband. And she's got this kennel of, of German shepherds. And she, she has a puppy that's the product of an unverified breeding. So a purebred German shepherd. 
and she's in dire straits and she wants me to take this puppy. What should I do? <laughs> now, the interesting thing is that her, the parents of this puppy had chosen their own mates. They didn't, they didn't, you know, they weren't being bred according to human standards. So this was very much like what Lady in her first lifetime wanted to do. She wanted to choose her own mate. So her, she had parents who chose their own mate. This dog was so, she was, she was a regular German Shepherd. She wasn't black, she had the regular coloring, but her personality was identical to ladies. Mm -hmm. uh, but my, I don't know who named her in the family, but they named her Inja, which means dog in Zulu. So it kept that South African connection. And she, so my mother actually did not believe in reincarnation. She, she, she watched my brothers and I go through all our memories and everything. And she was like, well, you know, I don't know if I believe in this. And then one day, it, my brothers and my mother and I, we were all listening to an old tape recording my brothers made when they were little kids. And in the background, you'd hear the dog barking. It was the exact same bark. And my mother listened to that bark and she went, that's so eerie. This has to be the same dog. And at that point she realized reincarnation is real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so after a while, Inja's boyfriend showed up. Now, this time, he was a purebred German Shepherd. He was exquisitely beautiful. In, in the, the annals of breeding with German Shepherds, they're allowed to introduce wolf from time to time because they're so, I don't know why they do that, but it's so genetically similar. It's for whatever reason, it's allowed. So I had a bit of wolf in him. So it gave him a beautiful rough. It gave him a very calm nature. And he was just, he was so polite. He, he was the perfect gentleman. Yeah. So <laughs> he made sure he was going to be past muster this time. <laughs> so he would come and visit regularly and, and, and Inja would be so happy and so excited. And, and, but he, because he was such a gentleman, he would refuse to take water. He would refuse to take food. And he'd finally get so hungry and thirsty that he'd have to go home. So then Inja would go into a dark room and pull herself out, outself up onto a couch and go, oh, oh, oh. She's so sad. <laughs> she sounded just like a human doing yeah. that. So some time went by and this would keep happening. Boyfriend would come over, boyfriend would get hungry, he'd go home, she'd be heartbroken. And one day the guy who owned this dog, whose name was Spade, said, well, I'm, he was pretty young and he said, I'm moving back in with my parents and they really don't want a dog around. Now this dog was a super expensive dog that he had imported from California. And, mm -hmm. but I, and my dog's always at your house anyway. <laughs> so I think you should take him. And, and so the family said, yes, we'll take him. And the two dogs were so, so happy. They were literally leaping up in the air together. Yeah. So it was a, it's a dog reincarnation story with a dog soulmate story. <laughs> That's really cute. With a happy ending. And they went on to have two litters of puppies. So it was very nice. That is nice. Yeah. So that's a dog reincarnation story. Cats. My, my closest, dearest cat, the animal I've mourned for more than any other animal. Her original name was Shortstop because she was an American short hair with a, then they have a short little face and really short tails. And she had had pneumonitis, which was, she, we, we lived just far enough outside of the city that every time somebody had a cute little kitten that wasn't cute anymore, they dumped it in our driveway. So that's why I had seven cats, because I'd always go, please, mom, can I keep it? <laughs> but anyway, she'd been dumped and she, had, she got sick. She got pneumonitis, which at that point in time was 100% fatal to cats. My mother and I just stayed up all night. We nursed her through it and she survived, but she took about three or four years to be able to meow again because there was the voice box was damaged. So she got the nickname Burpee and that was the name that I ended up calling her most of the time because she would try to meow and she'd just go, ah! <laughs> you know, make this funny little sound. But she was the sweetest, most gentle, most loving being. She's the one I talk about in my book actually mm -hmm. as the Pisces because I could tell the age she was when we got her because she was pretty young. And so I knew what sign she was. Mm -hmm. And she would, she loved to watch people, but the, all the other cats, because she was different, they attacked her all the time. She was always getting beaten up by other cats and running and hiding. So after she was gone quite a, quite a while, I ended up, I had so many rats, but there was this one rat 
and he was terrified of other rats. And I mean, we had a very peaceful little colony and the other rats would look at him like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and he's in, in, in terror, he's trying to escape from the cage all the time. And he, so he, he ended up, I finally, because rats are so smart, if they don't want to be in a cage, they can almost always figure out a way to get out. And he kept breaking out of the cage. And so I ended up, he and I just got so close. We got such a bond. He ended up living on my bed. Now, Burpee used to live on my bed. Now, Prunes lived on my bed. He was originally named Prunes because we ran out of names. We had so many rats. <laughs> we named one, one litter after fruit. So he was Prunes. <laughs> and his name, but his name was Poons when it because you know how you shorten stuff and get goofy. And he went with me, he went with me to school a lot of the time. I was in high school. He went with me to visit a friend who was having spinal surgery. He went everywhere. <laughs> but again, it was the, it, the inc this incredible, sensitive, gentle, kind, loving being. And I, I don't know how to describe how. It, when I, and it took years for me to realize, because when it's a different species, it, it, it don't, doesn't dawn on you that, well, then wait a minute, Burpee and Poons is the same soul. Mm -hmm. And what really kind of clinches it was his fear of his own species. Mm. Because Burpee was attacked by every other cat in the house. She was constantly attacked by her own species. She was afraid. She developed a fear of other cats because they were always out to get her. Now, Poons had no, was given no reason to be afraid of his own species. Nobody was mean, but because the past life was there and he didn't have any conscious awareness of all he knew was, oh, I got to get out of here sooner or later. They're going to attack me. <laughs> now, another one that the personality was just so incredibly unique and it is so obvious it had to be the same soul. And she also had a soulmate was a cat I had named Grace. And Grace, Grace was, a, she was a, a, I would never have an outdoor cat now, but at that time we lived in the country and our cats were outdoor cats. Mm -hmm. And she came in as a stray, and, but she was a consummate hunter. She could catch anything. Mm -hmm. She was just so incredibly skilled. She was, um, a, she was a very nondescript gray tabby cat, but she caught, she caught a, she caught a, a giant hawk with a huge wingspan. It was bigger than her. I'm sure it was trying to get her. <laughs> and she turned around and got it. <laughs> and she brought it in for her kittens. <laughs> and I don't know how to explain it. She, she would fish. She dove into the river and she'd come out with a fish. She would lie on the road in the, the nice warm sun, just where the car tires would go on either side of her. <laughs> so she knew she would be safe. You could vacuum her fur. If she was too hot in the summer, she'd sit under the sprinkler to cool off. She was just wow. It was Zen cat. cat. Wow. A master cat. Mm -hmm. And you know, after we, we had her fixed after she had the one litter of kittens, and then she would always bring food home for her four her four male babies and her mate. <laughs> They'd all be lying on the driveway waiting for the Grace Gravy train to bring them food. <laughs> you know, I guess like a pride of lions. <laughs> so Years, a few years go by, and when I started to have the rats, I had a, a rat named Eve. Now, here we have, it's funny, because Burpee and Poons were two silly names. Grace and Eve are two names that are primal female names. And there was a gray quality to both of them. Eve, Eve was a gray hooded rat, and she was a very, she, she had the same type of bone structure that Grace had. It was a little bit fine, a little bit refined and very understated appearance to both of them. Mm -hmm. But they were masters. This, this rat, um, she, rats have, I'm pretty sure they have 14 nipples, but she usually had about 21 babies and they were always fat. <laughs> she took <laughs> such good care of them. <laughs> and she would build a nest and she would fill the entire cage, we'd give her toilet paper and various things, she'd fill the entire cage up, but she would leave, she would leave a, a tunnel that the humans could look through to see the babies. Mm. You could handle the babies the moment they were born. And she would, she would, my mother would, would have some paper and things and Grace or Evie would come and climb up and look at the pocket and, and pull the stuff out to go make her nest. That was kind of the, the game that they played. She liked to go walking with us 
And, uh, you know, she's a little tiny creature. I carry her on my shoulder. You know, my brothers and I are going to take this big, long walk. But she'd keep climbing down me and go walking along beside us like a dog. <laughs> and she just had endless energy. Mm-hmm. And both, both Eve, both Grace and Eve had a black and white mate who was uh, kind of had a quiet dignity to them. And that, you know, I, I realized that that's probably the same soul too, because they look very similar. And I'm just trying to think of what kinds of other, yeah, I don't know. Evie was just, the, you know, the going, kind of always going beyond, going to the maximum of what a rat is capable of and, and beyond, but doing it in a really energized but quiet way. And Grace was exactly the same. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. So anyway, those are those are probably the most dominant experiences I have as far as what goes on with animal reincarnation. And since this is normally about astrology, I will say that astrology works on animals too. <laughs> and animals go through the same kinds of stages with the sun sign that, that people do. So. Yeah, and last time we were talking about what could be happening with your pets, like in your in your very like we had actually talked. I think it was a week ago, wasn't it? And yeah. it said, and I, because I'm in my fifth house, I, I would, um, there would be potential for my cat to be either ill or um, yeah. my animal to, to be yes. ill or um, yeah. to pass on in that time. So yeah. Yeah. About a week, week later on that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess that's, I don't just feel like there's anything else that you might be interested in asking about before we close. <laughs> um, so, well, I just more like, like specific to like Emily, like what, mm-hmm. like, so they don't necessarily come back, like reincarnate right away is what you're saying, no. right? No. Yes. So they would like, it depends on kind of what they want to do. Do you see Emily reincarnating with me? I think so. Yeah, I think you know, there's this, you know, one way you can tell is this feeling that things aren't done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just had such a strong bond, right? Yeah. It's yeah. Just a sweet little soul. So Yeah, yeah and, and love will draw, love draws us back together. And, you know, just the same with humans. We, we will meet humans again that we've loved before and we'll have this immediate connection. Mm-hmm. You pick up, you just, that's like within five minutes of meeting this person, you're picking up where you left off and you're best friends for life or you really just love them. Yeah. And, it, it, and because we all have, pretty, you know, we have a much longer lifespan than animals, we generally will meet, we, we're, the people we meet that we knew before, we didn't, we didn't overlap a lifetime with. There are some exceptions to that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes somebody dies young and they come back. I, yeah, I've, I, I know somebody who met, who met someone who had died, when, who was a very close friend of hers when they were both children and had died of cancer when she was a child, who then came back and she just this woman met her when she was an adult and there's this little girl again mm-hmm. who actually said, my arm, my arm had to be cut off when she's talking to her. And this, her, her little friend had had to have her, her arm amputated because of the cancer. I mean, she's, there were so many parallels. I, I don't know if I want to share the story because it's not my story. Yeah. But most of the time, we're, we're, we're meeting them, and it seems like we're meeting them for the first time, but it's not the first time, because animals have the shorter lifespan. They, several of their lifetimes can overlap one of ours. Yeah. How, lo- how many times does an animal reincarnate before they go towards, like, a human? I don't know if there's a hard and fast rule about that. I would, I would in terms of being on in the non-wild stage or in a stage where you have some kind of contact with humans, I'd say it would probably have to be at least five lifetimes. Mm-hmm. You can see some of the ones that are ready to reincarnate. You know, it's kind of funny if you see, if you see a, a car or a truck sometimes and the humans driving along and the animal, or the dog is sitting there in the front seat, but looking just like a human. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's so true. I love the dogs and the cars. <laughs> You can tell when they're getting close because they'll really start behaving a lot more like a person. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. 
and they'll just be so much more consciously aware. It's like they're almost, they're almost developing that frontal lobe that they don't necessarily physically have, although they might, who knows what's going on in, underneath that, underneath the bone and the head. <laughs> Maybe something is developing. Yeah. Yeah, that's good to know. But I, I did know a woman who, who had the memory of being a lion and she looked like a lion. I mean, sometimes you can tell what kinds of animals we were before mm -hmm. by how a person presents. Some people, you can just see the animal in them that they used to be or the animals they used to be. And she would watch the monkeys for a long time as a lion and be so fascinated with them. And then she remembered being the monkey and watching the humans for such a long time and being so fascinated by them. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell what animals like we like people were your clients? Like, sometimes, sometimes, you know, it all just depends. Interesting. Do you know what you were? Yeah. Oh yeah. I know a lot of what I was. Mm -hmm. There's actually a really good book. I wish I knew the title of it. I, it was, it's written by a man who lives North of Ottawa and I don't know if it was sort of privately published. I don't think it was a big publisher, but it's a book about re an animal reincarnation. And if anybody can find it, or if he happens to hear this and can tell me, this is my book, <laughs> I'd love to know. But he talked about how when in our lifetimes before we become pets or animals that have contact with humans, we, there are different rules about the development and, and the different phases we go through. And that most souls have three specific geographical locations that they have an affinity with that they return to over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, I suddenly realized that all my favorite animals all come from three specific geographical locations. <laughs> and they're also locations that I've had a lot of human lifetimes in. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So one of my memories is of being an aurochs, which is now extinct, but they're like a moose, the European moose. Really? I yeah. I definitely remember being rats because it makes sense because I'm such a rat lady and being, <laughs> and being cats. <laughs> but most, for the most part, I've had too many lifetimes as, as a, um, as a non-predator. If someone's had a lot I have more lifetimes as a predator, that can create obsessiveness. This is what this man talks about in his book. Uh, or, um, you know, to being too intense about everything that you feel. You can't get objective about things easily. This creates yeah. a struggle. And I don't know if he mentioned anything about if you've been an herbivore too much. <laughs> I don't remember him saying that. But I, when I look at me, I, I see this sometimes this challenge about asserting myself and fear issues and so on that it definitely comes from being, being, you know, being too much of an herbivore, <laughs> not enough of a predator. <laughs> we'll, have to find, we'll have to find out what this book is. I feel like I'd probably be a cat because I'm yeah. just a little bit more. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That's interesting. Well, I think that's probably where we're going to stop for this little section. Okay. Thanks.